we need to talk about what kingdom families or kingdom focused families look like. Now what, what on earth, literally what on earth does that mean? What does it look like? When we talk about the, the kingdom and kingdom focused families, it's like, uh, okay. What, what, what's that mean? I, I came across this satellite shot and this is an aerial view of a footprint in the Jordan Valley in Israel. Archaeologists have actually discovered six of these in the Jordan Valley. They are raised walls. Some of them are two football fields in length. And one of these is in Gilgal, and Gilgal was the place where Joshua and the Israelites camped before they actually crossed over into the land of Israel. And if you recall, God told Joshua something before they went into the land of Israel. He said, every place that the soul of your foot walks on, that have I given you. And Israel took that promise so seriously that they built footprints in the land of Israel because they literally believed that wherever God had previously walked, because God always goes before us and he tells you to do something, God's already been there, you're not doing it on your own. They understood that where God had already walked is where they were going to place their feet. And because God had already walked there, they were going to walk there, and God was going to give them every place, literally, that the sole of their foot stepped on. They believed that it was God's intent to have his imprint, listen, his imprint everywhere they walked. Here's another satellite aerial view of the land of Israel. It's a very mountainous region off to the right. To the east, you can see Jerusalem. And engraved in the rocks and the mountains, adjacent to Shiloh. Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle would be for about 400 years, where God's people would worship. Notice what he said in Jeremiah chapter seven. Go to my place which was in Shiloh where I set my name or I engraved my name at the first. God literally, that's the Hebrew for Yahweh. God engraved his name in the mountains of Israel. That's how serious God was about engraving his name upon his people. So when we talk about kingdom purpose families, we're not simply talking about something that is abstract. Thy kingdom, your will, your purpose, your plan. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We define in America Christian families as those who kind of live under the same roof and go to the same church. That is not a Christian family. A Christian family understands that God's imprint, listen, God's imprint has been placed on you so that you and your children and your grandchildren can walk in a world 
and step where God has already stepped and put his imprint because his imprint is in our lives. His goal is that everywhere your family walks, God's already engraved his name on you. So God's plan is that wherever you go, his imprint goes. That's the Christian family. So let's walk through this for a moment, the biggest challenge that you and I have in our homes and in our marriages and with our kids isn't communication, although we can learn to communicate better. How many of you know we can learn to communicate better? Sometimes we say dumb things. Anybody ever said any dumb thing to your wife before? Anybody said a dumb thing to your husband before? (laughs) Yes, okay, she's having revival over here. (laughs) Actually, her husband's having revival. She acknowledged it. (laughs) He he said something dumb yesterday. Good, thank you for letting us know that. (laughs) Good. Anybody ever said something crazy to your kids that you wish you had never said? (laughs) And are there any kids in the room that I shouldn't have said that to mom and dad? <laughs> okay. We, we, we've all done that. We can learn to communicate better. I heard the story about a man and his wife who were in Israel. And his wife passed away while they were in Israel. And they told him, sir, it's going to cost you $25,000 to bring her back to the U.S., but we can do all the graveside services here for $500. He said, fly her back. He said, why do you want us to do that? It's so much cheaper here. He said, because the last time somebody was buried here, they were raised from the dead, and I can't take that chance. Okay. Just, okay. So, <laughs> She said, where's Miss Tiffany? She's working in the nursery this morning. (laughs) And you're not saying one word to her. (laughs) Michelle's back there too, yes, okay. We can all learn to communicate better. We can all learn to get along better. But the biggest challenge you're having right now is not all those things that we normally think are challenging families. The biggest issue that you and I have right now is that the enemy of your soul will always challenge the original imprint of God that he designed for your family, your marriage, and your kids. That's the root issue of why we're struggling in homes Because if that divine imprint ever gets out, it'll change the world. It'll change the neighborhood. It'll change a city. It'll change a church. And we deal with all these surface issues. You don't love me. You don't talk to me right. You don't speak to me right. That's all stuff that we need to talk about at some point. But the ultimate issue in your kids and your grandkids and your marriage is that the devil's goal is always to thwart the imprint of God in a life. That's why you're having challenges. So let's walk through this for just a moment. The book of Exodus, chapter number one, about this time a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. How many of you know marriage is a good thing? um, I said, how many of you know marriage is a good thing? (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) Scaring me. (laughs) He that finds a wife finds a good thing. He that finds a husband finds a good thing. So they got married. The woman became pregnant. How many of you know having kids is a good thing? (laughs) Scaring me again. (laughs) She got pregnant. That happens when you get married. And gave birth to a son. 
She saw that he was a special baby. Pause. There's different translations of what that phrase means. They simply recognized something was unique about this child. Now, how do you, how do you notice in an infant? I mean, all infants are cute, right? Well, most of them are. Um, sometimes you say dumb things. <laughs> How do you see in that infant that there's something unique, something special? Some of them believe it's translated that Moses was like head and shoulders above other children, even in infancy. But I need you to understand that when God puts his imprint on a child, Every child at that point becomes special because God's hand is on the child. Every child that's ever been born in this room, you as a child or your children or grandchildren, every single one of them, don't forget this, they all have the imprint of God on them. And they saw that this child was different. And of course, there's this command by the Pharaoh, the, the king of Egypt, because he was threatened by how Israel was growing, he said, wipe out all the little boys. Remember this, that it's always the enemy's goal to get as much of the imprint of God out of the land as possible. That's why abortion is such a big deal, because it removes another imprint of God that could potentially affect the land and the kingdom. Hey, listen, if you were born after 1973, you're a miracle. Why? Because after that point, you could have been legally killed. And the command was, kill all the baby boys. Well, they, they, they hid him for three months, but when she could no longer hide him. Now, what happens to a three-year-old after they grow a little bit? They, they make noise, and it becomes obvious there's a kid there somewhere. We're... we're <laughs> it's hard to, to keep it hidden that there's a three-month-old baby. But she's not going to take his life because they recognized that the imprint of God was on the child. Listen, mom and dad, I know that kids become frustrating sometimes. Okay. There's another honest person down here. She said amen. Nobody's ever had a challenge with a child. I get it, but she has. Okay. <laughs> Two of them. Now, there's an honest family down here. There's one honest family in the room. <laughs> but in spite of the obstacles... She's not gonna, she's not gonna wipe him out. She's not saying, I wish he wasn't here. I wish we didn't have to deal with this issue. Look, families throughout history, and as you read through the Bible, families without, throughout history have always had to deal with stuff. So you're not the only one. So they took the child, watch this, when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket. The Hebrew word for that word is, wow. She got an ark made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. Now, I want you to picture this in your mind for a moment. How many of you would take your three-month-old child and say, well, you know, there's a good-looking river over there. Let me fix this little boat for him. I'm stick him in the river and see what happens. Adios, child! <laughs> Hope life works out for you. <laughs> Let's go to Starbucks. <laughs> Think about the emotional stuff that's going on inside of this mom. She put the baby in a basket, laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River, which, by the way, the Nile River was used to offer children. They would throw their babies. The Egyptians would throw their babies into the Nile River to the Nile River God. She watched and see what would happen. The baby's sister stood at a distance. Now, we, we know the end story. Pharaoh's daughter picks him up, and he grows up. We, we, but she doesn't know any of that. There's a huge amount of trust in God for her not to take the life of this child. 
because her own life could be taken. Where else do we hear the word ark? Look at this, Genesis chapter 6. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Watch this. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. In other words, make it waterproof. What is the purpose of the family? What is the purpose of parenting? It is to create an ark. Listen to me. It is to create an ark where the flood waters of filth of this world cannot get in. The goal is so that the boat won't sink. That's the primary goal of the Christian family, to create the imprint of God so in a world that has gone crazy, in a world that is immoral, in a world that doesn't have the mind of God, we do, and we waterproof the home so stuff can't get in and we don't sink. Okay. That, that, that's the goal. Now, 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 now watch this. First Samuel. In her deep anguish, Hannah. Who's Hannah? Hannah is married to Elkanah. Elkanah has two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. Now, that's a really bad idea. I, I've told you this before, but I just want to remind some of you that have not been here in times past. Jesus made it very clear that a man cannot be married to two women at the same time. He said, no man can serve two masters. <laughs> he said, and work. Just, just does not work. Just doesn't work. <laughs> Sometimes you say dumb things. <laughs> In her deep anguish, Hannah's praying to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Why? Because Panina, she's got all kinds of children. Hannah has none. She's barren. That was a big deal for an Israelite woman not to be able to birth children. Panina is an illustration of a Christian world, a church world, that has all the bells and whistles, but has no power or influence. She goes before God and she says, God, I need a child. If you'll give me a child, he's yours. Listen to me. Our children do not belong to us. Many of you in this room, you have children that are away from God. You gave them to God. Let the guilt of why they're not serving God today get off from you. You gave them to God. God cares more about that child than you do. Let him deal with that child. She made a vow and she says, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's ministry and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, I'll give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Now watch this. No razor will ever be used in his head. What she's doing is she is committing that child to the Nazarite vow. Now, most of the time, the Nazarite vow was voluntary. There were three things a Nazarite could not do. They could not cut their hair. They could not drink any fermented drink and they couldn't touch a dead body. Most of the time, that was voluntary, at times, God would, would imprint a separation on a child because what does God do when he wants to save a nation? He births saviors. He births prophets. He births people into that nation so that eventually his imprint can come through the mouth of that child. I'll give him to you all the days of his life, and he becomes one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament to the nation of Israel. Samuel, he was a separated child. Now, now, now watch this. In Judges, a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was unable to give birth. Listen to me. Some of you are not 
childless physically, but you feel childless spiritually. You have something inside of you that you feel God wants to do, but, you, but you, it seems elusive to you. You can't quite get there. God appears to the, the woman and says, you're barren and childless. Well, that's obvious. Listen, don't, don't ignore when God says the obvious. Yeah, God, I kind of know that. It means that God is going to do the opposite of way, the way things are. You need to grab a hold of that. God never tells you the way things are to keep things the way they are. God tells you the way things are so he can get involved in the middle of it and change it the way things are. Okay. You're barren, you're childless. You're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. See to it, you drink, watch this. You drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. So this child, which we know will be Samson, she doesn't know this yet, is called from birth to be separated because he's going to become a deliverer. He's going to become a voice for the nation. You'll become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Well, well, the husband hears about this. God doesn't appear to the husband because the husband can't get pregnant. I mean, that would be common sense in that day. So Manoah goes to God, and he says, hey, can you, like, show back up and have this same conversation with me? And then notice what he says. I beg you, let the man of God you sent to us come. Watch what he says. Teach us how to bring up the boy. Show us how to do this. Why does God tell her that she's supposed to live as a Nazarite mother before the child gets there. It's so that when the child is born, she'll already be in the habit so she can be an example. Show us how we're supposed to raise this child. We don't know how to do it. God heard Manoah, Samson is born. Now, watch this. We get, to the, we get to the Gospels. Now, everything that the Old Testament prophesied is going to come to happen with John the Baptist and Jesus. Just remember, and, and, and don't, don't miss this, that God decrees, but man must declare. Everything about Jesus was decreed in the Old Testament, but it took the prophets to declare it. There's a lot of things about your life, your marriage, your family, your kids, your grandkids that God has already decreed, but to bring it to pass, we must declare it. Prove, 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 prove that to me. I'll show you how serious God is about this. Zechariah was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood. Because of the number of priests, a priest might only be chosen one time in his lifetime to have this privilege to go in to the tabernacle area and actually the temple at this point and offer the incense that represented a type of prayer. Go and burn incense. He's in there. He's literally praying. People are on the outside praying. You want to hear from God, you have to pray. You, you, you're unlikely to hear from God watching Netflix. You will if you pray. I'm not saying Netflix is wrong. I'm just saying, or social media, all those things are with us, right? But you're likely to hear from God when you're praying. Thank you for that enthusiasm. The angel of the Lord appears to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Okay. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. That'd probably be the appropriate response if an angel stood beside you. Oh, hey, you know, I've seen you before. No. 
he's gripped with fear because he's thinking he's going to die because angels show up for judgment in his mind. I'm dead. And the angel said, don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? Read the text. They're old. They're past childbearing years. They prayed that prayer a lot of years ago, and in their mind, God didn't answer it and forgot about it. Can I tell you, when you pray, God records it and writes it down. There are some prayers that you prayed over your family. There are some prayers you prayed over your kids. There are some prayers you prayed over your marriage. There are some prayers you prayed you thought, well, I guess that's not going to happen. Hold on. God doesn't forget about it when you pray about things that matter to him. Okay. Your prayer's been heard. Your wife Elizabeth's going to bury you a son, and you are to call him John. He'll be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He's, watch this now. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. What does God do when he wants to save a nation? He births people into the nation that have the imprint of God on them so his voice can be heard in the nation. Hold on to it now. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the, watch this. This child is going to turn the hearts of the parents to their children we always think that the children need to be turned to their parents. They need to obey their parents. The prophetic voice is always to turn the heart of the parent back to their responsibility to raise prophets in the home. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What does God do when he wants to save a nation? He births people into that nation that have his imprint and they will transfer God's imprint. The kingdom family transfers God's imprint from what God said into a nation. Listen, God never looks for a method. He looks for a man. He looks for a woman. Well, we can do this, we can make this plan, we can do this, and we can do this, and we'll do this and that. God's not interested in our methods. He's interested in a man or a woman that will listen to him and do what he says. Men and women have changed nations throughout history, not methods and plans and schemes. And when it comes to the body of Christ, I get that we have to organize. I get the church needs to do certain things. I understand that. But the last thing the church of Jesus Christ in America needs right now is another plan. We need some men and women and kids who will listen to the voice of God and do what God says. Find the mind of God and do it. Okay. Now, 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 why does any of this matter? Why does it matter to you in your marriage today? Why does it matter to you and your kids today? It doesn't matter what age your kids are because the imprint of God never leaves. Never leaves. It's at conception, God's imprint is there. It never leaves. Now, it may get distorted. It may get skewed. It may take a lot of detours, but the imprint of God is always there. When you were born into this world, look at somebody right now and say, you have God's imprint. You do. So when God was trying to bring his people back to him, oh, I know the imprint gets distorted. Things have happened to people. Bad things happen to people. There's abuse that happens. There's, there's addictions that happen. There's pain that happens. There's, there's you know, we, we have this in our mind that, you know, we're all going to grow up and we're going to be in this cute little house with a white picket fence and we're all going to live happily ever after. Everybody in this room has some issue that you've had to deal with over the course of your lifetime. It is the attempt of the enemy to distort the image of God. But that image of God 
doesn't go away. Well, I've, I've, I've really sinned away the image of God. Seriously? You cannot sin away the image of God. It is stamped on you at conception. Case closed. So watch, watch, watch what happens here. God is trying to pull his people back to himself. He's calling them back. And this is, this is the prophetic voice. Listen to me. The prophetic voice is not some weird like... Oh, prophets, yeah, okay. Everybody in this room is a prophet. Oh, no, we're not. The Bible says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If you claim to know Christ, your voice is supposed to be speaking his words to the land. So watch what happens here. God will continually call his people back to himself and when you run through the words of the prophets in the scriptures, there are certain things that just grab you and stand out. And, and here's one of them, Amos chapter two. Look what God says, I raised up prophets, listen, from among your children. Nazarites, now let's not just talk about the what that specific Nazarite vow was. Let's talk about God's idea of separation. Different. See, what's, what's funny about this is that when Elizabeth and Zechariah get this word from God that they're going to have a child, and Zechariah says, well, you know, I don't know about that. You know, we're pretty old. God closes his mouth. He's unable to talk. You know, our staff retreat, Andre was there for our staff retreat. He really illustrated this well. He's, you know, he's, he's in, Zechariah's in the, in the temple, right? And suddenly he's, I don't know, God, if this is going to happen or not. And suddenly God says, you're not going to be able to talk. Why did God shut his mouth? Because he doesn't need somebody proclaiming something opposite of what God has said. You know, there's a lot of us in our families and in our marriages, we take a look at the way things are and then we say the things that are. We should not be saying the things that are. We should be saying the mind and the will of God of the things that shall be. Well, he's nothing but a loser. No, 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 no. He's got the imprint of God. It's never going to change. Oh, no, 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 no. He's got the imprint of God. And so he shuts his mouth, he shuts his mouth and Zechariah comes outside the temple. And what does he do? mm mm Mm. He can't talk, he can only make noise and grunt. Nine months. <laughs> when the child is born, suddenly his mouth is opened. And you can hear, they, they raised John the Baptist as a Nazarite, like he's like separate. You can hear, you can hear some of the parents in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, Zechariah, your, your kid's a little odd. Uh, he doesn't go everywhere all the other kids go. He doesn't watch the same movies. He doesn't go to the same places. He doesn't even go to the dance. What's the matter? Your kids are, you're raising a weird kid, Zechariah. See, I understand it in our culture, folks. There is pressure on parents every day to make their kids conform. You see, we think it's important if God has a child that's popular. God thinks it's important if he has a child that's full of power. And there's pressure on the parents to conform. That the child can somehow be something. I, I remember years ago, and you know, sometimes when you raise kids in a church as a pastor... You, you kind of become a glass house a little bit because um, I, I have to tell you this, the worst thing you can say, uh, it's, we're past this point now, but in years past, the worst thing you can say to a pastor's kid is, you're a pastor's kid, you ought not to do that. 
what is the matter with your head? Why would somebody ever say something like that? You work at Walmart, you shouldn't do that. It just doesn't have the same impact, does it? <laughs> and I remember Tiffany was praying about some of these things and the isolation that some of our kids were, were experiencing. And the Lord said to her, listen, this is my plan. Look at me. If your child cannot stand by themselves when nobody is around, they'll never be able to stand for God when everybody's around. And there are those parents that want to live their teenage lives through their children. Oh, I just think it's wonderful. I just think it's great that my, my, my 10-year-old is going to a movie with his little girlfriend. What are you thinking? You're living your own teenage lives through your kids. You just want to recreate a bygone year. God's trying to raise up prophets among us. I can, I, can hear, I can hear the parents and friends around Zechariah and Elizabeth. He's weird. He just wants to read the Bible and pray. He wants to go to prayer meetings. <laughs> Get him out of church. Let him do something where you can, like he can, he's, he's turning into a prude, Zechariah. Come on now. Nobody hears from him. He's isolated. Nobody hears from the child. He's isolated. He doesn't make the best grades in school. He, he doesn't have a lot of friends. 30 years later, when he opens his mouth, the whole nation is paying attention. That's what God's trying to raise up in your home. This is why how you live matters. Can, can I just say this? You know, if you've been to this church any time at all, you know, we, we really do love people. We honestly do. Look at somebody and say, they really do love us here. But look, listen to me. We are responsible to create the atmosphere of the presence of Jesus. Rick, come on to the keyboard. It makes everybody feel better when the worship guy comes to the keyboard. Thank God he's getting done. It makes, it makes everybody... Um, your responsibility is to, to create an atmosphere in your home with the presence of God. What's going on in your home right now that is offensive to the presence of Jesus? So it doesn't affect my kids, really. Watch this. I was raising up separated children in your kids and in your teenagers. Is this not true? You made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. In other words, you said your lifestyle didn't matter. Hey, it doesn't matter what you do. You said the alcohol doesn't matter, the porn doesn't matter, the atmosphere doesn't matter. Look, if you're living together with somebody, we love you. But you're not married in the eyes of God. It's not how it works. We'll do the premarital counseling for you. We'll get you married. We'll do it for you. We'll do one big ceremony here on Sunday morning. We'll just marry a bunch of people. Wouldn't that be awesome? That'd be cool, wouldn't it? But you've got to get this right. You just can't keep living that way and expect that the atmosphere of the presence of God is going to raise up the prophets that God is wanting to raise up. Look, 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 look at this. This is how this is translated in the Message Bible. I raised up some of your young men and women to be prophets. I set aside your best youth for training in holiness. Isn't this so, Israel? Isn't this so, America? Isn't this so, Christ alive? But you made the youth in training break training. And you told the young prophets, don't prophesy. It's too much for us. Let me tell you what has become very obvious to me over the last number of months.
in this house right here. God is touching children and young men and women to be a voice for him in the land. In your home right now, you've got kids, you've got grandkids, and some of your, some of your kids are older and say, well, I guess I'm past this. No, no, no. Moses doesn't prophesy until he's 80. God is raising up young men and women to be a voice for him, a kingdom voice, a kingdom family. This, this is what God's doing. We, we, we cannot think that somehow it's okay just to be casual about it. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna raise something up that's gonna be a voice to the world. And you got to cultivate it in the right atmosphere. Matters. I raised up some of your young men to be prophets, and I set aside your best youth for training and holiness. Isn't this so, Christ alive? But you made the youth in training break training, and you told the young prophets, it's not important. This is why God wants to take his imprint, his stamp, and stamp it all over your family, stamp it all over your kids, stamp it all over your house, stamp it all over your job. We are to be influencing the kingdom. Listen, listen. The, we are to be influencing government and education and social scientists, and the arts, and sports, everywhere the imprint of God goes. Why? Because the imprint wherever I go, goes wherever I go into the culture that I'm living in. Okay, that, that's the stand with me right now. That's, that's, that's God's heart. That's God's mind. Stand up right now. Come on. Sweetheart, come here, sweetheart. Can you come see me for a minute? You're awesome. Come here, come on up here with me. Ready? Jump. Okay. Oh, you don't need to jump. Good. What's your name? Ellie. Hey, Ellie, how you doing? Come here. How old are you? You're six. <laughs> Wasn't very long ago I was your age. God wants to do with your life, Ellie? Have you thought much about it? Probably not. Yeah. At six years old, I was in a sandbox with my Tonka trucks. I like Tonka trucks, by the way. Not the plastic ones, the metal ones. Okay, the ones that were real. Okay. <laughs> Ellie, the imprint of God is all over your life. Stretch your hand toward Ellie right now. Come on. Ellie, God's going to be a father to you. God's going to be a mother to you. You're going to open up your voice. And you're going to speak things. You're going to hear things in your head. Say, I don't understand why I'm hearing that. Because that's God talking to you. Holy Spirit, I pray across this room right now. Lord, let the prophetic mantle, it's already fallen. God, let the prophetic mantle, let it become aware of it right now. Lay your hand on somebody beside you right now. Lay your hand on somebody beside you right now. Just pray this, God's kingdom imprint in Jesus' name. 
God's kingdom imprint in Jesus' name. He's raising up young girls just like this all across this house, folks. Where's your young boy? Is there a young boy here somewhere? Is there a kid here somewhere? Come here, buddy. What's your name? Elijah. Father, in Jesus' name, let his voice be heard throughout the world. Let him stand in separation from a perverse and vile generation. Let him stand for you, God, I pray. I pray over every family, every marriage, every child. In Jesus' name, Lord. We call forth kingdom families out of this house right now. Don't care what's going on yesterday. Don't care what's going on the last 10 years. Lift your hand toward the Lord right now and say, Jesus, right now, we start again. We start again. Let the imprint of God come out of me. Let the, pray it now, let the imprint of God come out of my life. May the kingdom of God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Would you make a recommitment to Christ right now in this room? Say, Jesus, I make a recommitment to live as a kingdom family. Can't run from this, folks. It's too important. I make a commitment right now, a recommitment to live as a kingdom family. God, I pray for every son and every daughter that is away from you today, God. Those, Lord, that have drifted. God, they may even be in church, but they're not passionate for you. They're never in the Word. They don't pray. Lord, awaken their souls, oh God. I pray you'll awaken the families of this house. God, let an awakening break out in our families, in our homes, in our marriages, God, I pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we make a recommitment to you in this house, Lord, today. Some of you, when you leave here, you need to go to your homes. You need to get some stuff out that's inside of that house. Get it out. I'm not going to tell you. what it, You ask the Lord what to do. You just ask the Lord, what do I need? What's in this house that needs to exit and be put in the trash? What is it? You ask the Lord. I, I'm not going to be so legalistic to tell you, well, you need to do this and this and this because I don't know what God's talking to you about. But if he's talking to you about something, would you get it in the trash can or delete it off a computer or a phone or a television? And can we create an atmosphere to raise prophets that will speak for God in Jesus' name? Can we do that? Thank you, Elijah. Thank you, Ellie. Let's go home, folks, and be kingdom families in Jesus' name.